So anyway, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity because this past 19 going on 20 months has been an extraordinary adventure, not just for um, us, but for everybody. Um, this past January, I was reassigned to CBP's COVID czar. You know, imagine my surprise as ag specialist um, <laughs> responsible at the CBP level, working directly with the department and other departments uh, to get our folks in CBP or uh, 1A and 1B vaccinated. I can tell you a lot of stories. We could spend all day on that, but suffice it to say, I did learn a couple of valuable things. One is, and, and probably the take home is this disease um, is, is quite the challenge for all of us from the medical side, on every side and dimension that you can think of, not just internally to us, but externally to the entire United States and, and the world. So this presentation is going to focus um, on what we term our COVID-19 update because that's kind of the where we are, you know, where were we, uh, where we are now, and, and where we're going. And um, from a volumetric impact to tease you a little bit with some statistics that I think are quite compelling, we'll use the month of April, right, as, as our benchmark, um, April 2019, April 2020 in April 2021. That was the first full month of crunch uh, when things basically stopped for all intents and purposes. On, on the land border, private vehicles uh, from, from 2019 to 2020, the vehicles went down volume 65%. Um, now in 2021, it's only down 36%. And that will change dramatically when and if the uh, sanctions and the restrictions are completely, completely lifted. In the international air uh, environment from 2019 to 2020, folks, we were down 98%. In some airports, well, in the top 20, all but two were getting passengers uh, for the month of April into May, June, and, and July. Um, now, we're down 71%. That's all international airports. Some are still getting nothing. Uh, Hawaii is still only getting you know, maybe 3% of what they normally get because they're, they're different, um, the way they're, they're, their state is operating. Uh, some ports in Dallas, Houston, that are getting Central and South American flights, their volume is only down 20 to 30 percent from 2019. Others are still down 70, 80, 90 percent. Um, land border cargo, um, from 19 to 20, we're down 27 percent. From 2019 to 2021, we're up 6 percent. And the reason 2020 was down so much is because of April, May, and June. There was just a lot of ambiguity and trade pretty much slowed. And then it started taking off and practically every month after that had an increase over 2019, but the decrease was so interesting during the three month period that they just didn't have the opportunity to exceed 2019. Cargo overall, air, sea, maritime, everywhere, the train um, up dramatically from, from 2019. So the ag specialists we've got, obviously in the other officers, you know, they've, they've never really relinquished their job, as you can imagine. And we did deviate from the norm with, with, with such a reduced passenger volume and the concern and safety and well-being of our employees as well uh, with, with whether safely leave, safety leave. We did shift assets nationally and our priorities to things like cargo, which like I said, didn't change too much. Compliance related activities, both in the regulated garbage, but also warehouse exams and general compliance using a much broader uh, definition of compliance. Internet driven things, we'll get into that a little bit. Express courier, international mail, uh, both of which to say burgeoning would not do it justice because the volume there is going through uh, the ceiling as Mr. Lissy said. Um, one of our initiatives as well is to, to work with them on, on that because it's, um, it's quite a huge hole, it's quite a huge hole. Um, special projects, training and, and outreach, which the last two of which, the training and outreach, I'm not going to cover uh, on this one. I am going to cover a little bit on our strategic plan. We've got this new innovative CBP-1 application for your telephone that can help in a lot of ways. I'll get to in a minute. I'll tell you what's in it for you from a national plant board as a, as a, as a collective. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the biological threat paradigm for a couple of novel tra uh, targeting initiatives and finish with um, with Ag K9. In, in the interest of time for, for you guys, I'm not gonna cover training. There'll be a couple, a little bit on biological threat, but the risk based sampling initiatives we've been ankle knee deep in with, with Matt Rhodes and Mr. Ulysses Shop, converting the National Ag Release Program slowly and methodically to true risk based sampling, looking at the pest load per shipment instead of this country's got this bug, 
we don't want the bug in here, so therefore look at it this way. It's, it's, it falls in line with, with what Osamo talked about with that, the cool map he had on there with the different colors and stuff. The capability of a pest to come into the United States and become established. Those are the things APHIS is working on. We're working on the things to find out specifically where in those foreign countries, the trade routes, the supply chain in and of itself, and what risk does it present for a possible uh, introduction to the United States. Um, and outreach, save this one thing. We've greatly expanded our outreach activities, some of it through and with APHIS, some of it through and with our trade and industry associations, and some of it by our local field operators, folks who are on the phone uh, right now watching this, working independently, but collectively with us, tying into some of our national initiatives, but spinning it to what's in it for their trade units uh, and their, their folks working uh, for them locally. But next year at the regional plant board meetings, we'll cover um, more things like this. Jay, did you get the slide up yet? No way. There's yep, yep, it's up and running. I'm just, I'm on the second slide. I'm not sure which one you're on. Yeah, it says Mission Accelerator. Is that it? Yep, that's it. Uh, cool. Okay, so like, what a name, right, guys? Where does this come from? Well, this is what happens when you grant your employees complete editorial privilege which means that was really a good thing. It was a blessing, because don't let me name stuff. I'll come up with some arcane thing back from when I was a kid, which we didn't want to go there. So the strategic plan, it may appear boring to have a strategic plan in it, but it's not. It's not. It determines, the plan determines what our focus is, which directly impacts you as a plant board, all the states, but also APHIS and PPQ and veterinary services and the State Departments of Agriculture and Congress and, and DHS. You know, we're continuing to refine this and, and expand our mission set, and we're not compromising anything else about it. We're still looking at produce. We're still doing everything. But what's happened is our funnel is becoming larger, but we're up to the challenge to deal with the funnel. Uh, we spent the last year recrafting and relaunching the strategic plan. And actually, I can't say I did a whole lot other than kind of usher it through and be the guy that's like kicking people back into play and, and, and the basic the adjudicator and the decision maker on this is good, this is better, and, and that sort of stuff. But all the ideas came from the employees in the field. It was the first time ever in 18 years. Um, and even before that, we've had such a huge lift to the field using things like these computers and this little white light that says I'm on TV and doing things that way instead of gathering everybody together, put them on an airplane and fly them in, which proves that operating in this environment this way can work and it does serve a survey a, a function. This plan aligns with the CBP and the OFO priorities. It also aligns with what Mr. Elissi has and some of his priorities. It ensures our future initiatives are going to benefit not only ag, but also contribute to CBP's overarching mission. You know, economic resiliency, economic recovery, uh, business resumption, travel recovery, those sorts of things. That's what's passionately referred to as mission ag celebration, crafted with the field and our, our, our other um, entities that we deal with a little bit beyond OFO and NCVP. The first one is mission criticality. And it's not really what we call foot stomping over here, you know, but oh, let me tell you about this again. No, it's without having to prove and get on my day gone pedestal, everybody now is asserting that CBP's ag mission is just as critical to CBP as every other component. Now, Osama can tell you, and Matt can tell you, and I got no problem telling you 10, 12, 15 years ago, Annie was there, you know, 2008. I think Carl was the president then, man. We were in the stuff. We were this close. Ask Craig Regelbrugge. I mean, he, he knows. We were this close. And, and we've rebounded. Now, I didn't rebound us. We rebounded. Us doing outreach, inreach, all these other stuff. The point, on this mission criticality thing, we're just as important as everybody else. I have a new administration now I'm working for, as Mr. Alissi indicated. I got new bosses too, as he has as well. And, and I mean, from top all the way down. And nobody is saying that ag is not important. As a matter of fact, ag is starting to become mellifluously expressed. This means just comes right out just like it does security enforcement and agriculture. Biological security enforcement. And we're gonna to touch on this a little bit with the chief protector of, US, of the US from dangerous biological threats to domestic security. So expand a little bit about that and get outside the paradigm, the agricultural paradigm. A biological threat is a federal noxious weed. It's also a nematode, it's a mollusk, it's an arthropod, it's a plant disease, foreign animal disease. It's also something more insidious and nefarious, you know, some, a, a, a CRISPR altered genome of something that's not, not even in the human world with CDC, but it could still impact us. That's a biological threat too. And domestic security, that's everything. 
I mean, getting rid of ALB, that helps domestic security. It started out on a bullion program way back in the day. And now 17 million acres, that's domestic security we're growing work on. The last thing is economic resiliency. Our ag mission ensures the U.S.'s economic vitality. We safeguard a trillion dollar ag economy. We don't do it ourselves, okay? So don't think that, it's not grandiose, not at all. We do nothing by ourselves. We do everything in concert with you and with Mr. Alessi's staff principally, but as well as veterinary services. This will be a success because we have owners of this, business owners, and I'm not driving the show on this, which I'm very happy to say. Next slide, Jay. All right, I'll CB1 Mobile. I have to make a play for this because this thing, I can't believe it. What I'm going to do at the end of this, there's an ask for you guys. So Julie, if someone wants to be part of the, um, the critical group that kind of looks at this and plays with it in a manner of speaking, we can experiment with it and make sure that it serves the needs of you and, and y'all, your customers, your customers within the state. So there's a kind of a little ask there. You just send me an email. I can shoot you over to who our folks are on that. But this app in and of itself, it's not just for passengers, but it could be. I mean, it will be, so you can get off an airplane. And you can also go on the app, and he says, you know, I'm a global entry person, but. I did buy some chocolate. I do have some bulbs where I have to look at this. This application will let him do it. Someone can meet him, not plain side. They can come back and be ushered through. They can set up an appointment in a manner of speaking. It's all virtual. And they take a look, make sure he's got his permits and everything so he can come in. But it's the same thing with people that, that, that have. Um, tissue samples, hunting trophies, pet dogs, cats. What type of commodity is it? Yeah, you can put it in there. The location of the commodity, I got it hand carried, it's in my check baggage. And, and you can securely submit images of, of your agency issued permit. If you bring in soil back, and it's not a big truckload or you'll need of it, it's, it's, in, it's right here. Okay, do you better have a permit from, from Osama's shop because the state all the other stuff. Make sure that stuff is there. That can all be uploaded. And if needed, the ag specialist that will be assigned to your exam, they can use the interactive chat and say, hey, I'm here. Come in, do this, and upload documents. Cargo feature, which is used right now in Miami. We picked the lion's share because 91%, I think it's 91%. No, that's cut flowers. 60 or 70% of the pressure fresh fruits and vegetables and air come in through Miami International Airport. So we had two people, seven days a week, three. Kevin, we lost you on audio. I don't know what happened. I heard it. what, you know, I would like to say it was one of my dogs playing squeaky toys, but not this time. I have thrown them out of the, my five beagles out of the, um, out of the room. Okay. Let's see. Hold on a sec. Back to the other hand. Back to full screen there. That's better. Okay. In Miami. Yeah. Perishable cargo feature. The brokers. Oh, instead of having uh, six people a day, seven days a week, that ends up being a lot of people and they're all supervised. We do on all this scheduling appointments and stuff. It's done through the application. Now they upload their documents and say, I got cut flowers, I got fresh produce, I need to do this. And it's working beautifully. If it works there in the air environment, it'll work anywhere. So as part of the development and refinement of this, so prior to our official launch, we have not launched it. We're convening an external focus group that's going to gain access to the traveler feature. And we want to ask you guys, so Julie, if, if, if I may ask on, on you on behalf of the plant board, I know you just were extolling truly and seriously, you know, the, how your folks pony up and volunteer and stuff. This is not going to take a lot of time to do, but if you have some folks that might be traveling internationally or are familiar with international travel, this will be awesome. I would love to have you guys on there because in return, you, you have skin in the game because when you guys come back in, you may or may not have something, but at least you'll have more of the process. So um, down the road. Maybe we can do that right after this. Next slide, Jay, biological materials. Please, sir. All right, this all threats bullet. This posture that we've got, and this has taken a lot of time to socialize this in, internally so people don't wig out and interfere and have this, um, you know, like we're being enforcers and stuff. They're gonna strap on some 
iron and give me a dig on big old stick to knock people out. No, it, it, it's not that. It's not that. Every time an ag specialist opens up a suitcase, they have an opportunity to find much more than just the regulated fresh fruits, vegetables, meats, eggs, soil, pests, all that. We open 85% of the suitcases for people coming back to the United States when suitcases are open. 85%. What do you think the opportunity is for us to find, I don't know, narcotics, intellectual property? We find everything. So we train our guys now. We've twisted it. We've taken everything you've been trained at the PDC and all of your experience and everything now. That's valid. It's virtuous. Absolutely. Don't get tunnel vision. Looking at the x-ray. Don't focus on the mango, the chicken leg. Start looking at that other stuff up there. There's documents in there. And conversely, with the officer, it's symbiotic. There's an F2, you know, it's, it's the featured training program that we've got going on with the officers and same thing. Just stay focused is really the reality of that. Not memorizing, do you have any fresh fruits, vegetables? You got $10,000 in all to give. Those serve a purpose, but let's make it more intellectual. If we go with biometrics, like we're going with biometrics, and you volunteer your face when you leave Germany and you come to the United States, and you're all happy, not sad, and you come in and you're approaching me at the, at the pedestal, I already know who you are. I've got 100% certitude. That, that's a Samuel Lissi. Got it. Doc, how you been? Come on in the United States. Welcome. Let's talk about the intent of your trip. And he's excited. They know who he is. This stuff is working. I love this stuff. Can't wait to get home, though. Hope this doesn't take too long. How long were you away? Those sorts of questions come into play. And thank you. Next. Now, I'm oversimplifying and being funny for, for a fact. But, guys, that's where we're going with this. That's where we're going. So anything associated, because he may say, yeah, I was over in uh, Italy, and I bought a ham, and I have this certificate, and Aggie has to look at me. Because if someone knows all the rules and stuff, and he gets adjudicated that much quicker. We've got subject matter experts in, in this program that I'll get to in just a second. It was established, the exclusion program, the biofuel exclusion program last May. We rolled it out. Um, we had an administrative draft, got hiring, we had all these, we onboarded some employees, bio threat exclusion coordinators. They're in, they're in strategic locations right now. They got specialized expertise. They've got specific access to classified information, um, stuff that we can't talk about. But their work, their internal and external coordination of their actions are related to securing, isolating, and deterring the entry of non-compliant biological materials. It's not just the select agents. It's also soil samples and other samples like that. So you see where I'm going with this. It's, 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 it's much larger than, 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 the, than the, the real thin lane of you know, a bad B movie, right? It's, it's way beyond that. So to build upon this, um, CBP, has also created a bio threat ops specialist. Those are the GS-12s who are at the ports of entry and they're embedded in our targeting and analytical units. And they pair up with the, the, the um, counterterrorism response team. So they're the smartest person in the room before the FBI comes in and the air gets sucked out of the room. They're the ones asking the, the postdoc candidate some questions about their permitting and stuff like that because they can relate to that. We train them on those things and we make them a little bit smarter. Sounds like all smoke and dagger, guys. It's not. This is the natural evolution for us to finally get to this point. Um, the training, it's conducted and, and being enhanced um, by a special crew that we've got. We'll get to that in just a second. We've got a Center for Cross-Border Threats and Supply Chain Defense. It's a huge acronym with the department. They're building us an epidemiological series, a 101, a 102, and some others for us to create a more robust ag specialist uh, senior academy, a post academy, it's well beyond what we get at, 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 at Frederick and, and down at Fletz. This is it's like beyond postgraduate work, three, four, five, six years in, we're starting to give additional information. It complements the musters and the other things um, that we're pushing out. They're working also with the FBI's uh, Weapons of Mass uh, Destruction Directorate to develop and deploy an introduction to biological threats course and how they interplay with us. And um, Biological threats, folks, of all kinds and types, you know, it's, it's, it's a real and le legitimate risk to us. And when I say that, closing down this topic at the bottom of the funnel, from plant pests and mollusks, nematodes and everything else, and all the way across the spectrum to the select agents and the nefarious stuff, they're all biological threats. Our job in headquarters is to teach them about all of them, to become savvy and aware of them not an expert in any of them. We got experts out there. But we own the B in the C, B, R, N, E, and the biological, radioactive, nuclear, and explosive 
poster chart of all the bad stuff that can happen to us. We're kind of like the B people. We're not the experts. We have experts. But we're the ones that can adjudicate at a port of entry. Interdict, turn it over, how to handle that sort of stuff. All right, next slide. Live insects, AGM, targeting. This is pretty phenomenal. Um, you see there in the, in the top, you got three pictures on the left for live insects. Some really crafty way that people are smuggling this stuff in. And on the right there, we're going to talk about microzoning and geospatial um, automation within the confines and the, and the construct of all the regulations that APHIS has for, for Asian gypsy monkey. On the left, in May of 2018, Louisville calls us, they call MAC2, our National Ag Cargo Targeting Unit. Hey, we're sharing some information with you guys. I had a re recent seizure and expressed concern. Newly hatched praying mantis eggs from Great Britain. All right, now they may not live in Great Britain, but that's a staging point, just like Hong Kong. Hong Kong is for most of the stuff coming out of the, um, of the Far East. So NAC2 creates a new targeting approach, they leverage several systems, create workflows, they do all the magic that they do. It takes a while to do that. Now, this was May of 2018. The results have been 110 interceptions of live insects. So this has been refinement after refinement after refinement. We have a positive referral rate of 53%. So more than half of the things that our guys, that many folks send to the field, hey, y'all look at this, find something. They're getting that good. It often includes smuggling examples or like inside speakers. We found egg masses inside speakers. You know, that one there is, is a mantis egg inside of a decorative egg itself. That's a decorative egg, the one on the bottom on, on the right there. The one on the left, those are Legos. Yeah, there was some um, <laughs> bug in there. And the one on the top, that's an old fashioned mouse we used to have before we had these infrared ones or no mouse at all. Um, yeah, there's, there's all that. Networks operate in the mail and express consignment pathway through social media platforms. We've also been trolling in the dark web and stuff, which, ooh, that's scary. No, not really. You know, these folks, uh, some of them, are really odd and different. You know, these, these homegrown violent extremists and stuff. I'll just share this with you real quick, but it'll be really quick. But nothing ever quick for me. You guys know that. But if they're really bad, nefarious, and wigged out, they can be dopers, they can be whatever classification. So not a judgment, just a educated statement on what they represent. They like the weird stuff, right? They like to use ape hands as ashtrays. They like ocelot skins, snow leopards, anything. They like red, giant African land snails for their escargot. They like foot long centipedes out of the uh, out of South America and Central America. So in the dark web, you can get anything, pretty much. And, and so we're starting to see, and we're gonna keep going down this wormhole, that connection. Eventually, we're gonna have that Kodak moment someone really big and bad that we're going to get through all the other three letter agencies. Remember, I just interdict me being the commissioner of customs. I just find it, gather the information, pass it along. Now I'm looking for the next one. We're going to have that. We've had some very, very high value targets. This is about as, it's as amorphous as I can speak to you. We've had positive um, adjudications from U.S. attorneys in certain areas, certain SAC offices for the FBI. People have gone to jail. For stuff like this that I, I can't talk about, but they can. Again, what do we do? We interdicted it. We showed them how we did it, and, and we kind of move on from there. That is just so cool. Now over to Asian Gypsy Moth, this geospatial vessel targeting. I can't even comprehend this stuff. It's like, are you kidding? This is worse than programming and, and Fortran back when I was a kid, for those of you that are like as old as me. So since 2018, there have been 177 positive AGM funds, 1,320 egg masses, 12.5% approach rate. Historically, we get 1%. So oh, approach rate, meaning 12.5% of all the vessels, 12.5 out of 100, I'm finding something on. In the last 10 years, before 2018, one out of 100, just based on general, just here we're going to go. In 19 and 20 calendar years, were the largest AGM interdiction years in CBP history, or 18 years young. MAC2 automated this coastwise notification system for AGM fines. We re resulted in 100% reboarding of all the vessels. We need to look at downstream, finding it seven additional AGM vessels on the, on the um, AGM interceptions on, on some of those vessels. Does not mean they didn't find it at the first instance. It means that they found it, maybe didn't find anything else. On the next one, they're compelled to look at it and they're looking harder or in different areas, knowing where they already looked. There's all that information, all of that. This part of the complex is to send all that forward. This microzoning. The definition of it, it's a geospatial targeting method, targets a defined amount of conveyances by using this threat assessment gap analysis 
and identifies small areas of interest. So usually we're looking at one dock in Seoul, Korea, one dock. And we noticed adjacent to that dock was a little island about pff, half a mile away. And where the gypsy moths like to hang out? Well, on islands, I mean, where's a lot of trees? No one lived on that island. And what are they doing? They're loading at night. And what do the moths do at night? The females fly, you do the math, there you go. That that's, that's it, that's it. So you just take that and you go with there. You add biology to it and NASA information and the, the um, air and land and sea people giving me all the temperatures and gradients and working with Otis and all this. You this huge thing that's just bigger than U.S. steel, which I know that's old for me to say that, but some of you would understand what that is. So the vessels are targeted in advance, knowing all this, when a monsoon's coming, when there might be nuptial flight, all those things. And that's what's all contributing to the positivity. It's, it's unbelievable, folks. It's, it's, it, it's just unbelievable. All 134 seaports and the 67 areas of responsibility are pre-programmed to alert the port in real time upon a targeted vessel's arrival. So it satisfies all the coast-wise notifications. I mean, what, what a gem. We're not guessing anymore. We finally refine this and we're collecting the data, passing everything along to APHIS electronically and instantaneously so that they know an AGM suspect is coming, but more importantly, state plan health director and others that need to know, know that we found a suspect AGM. Next slide, Jay. All right. Wouldn't be fun without talking about woodpecker material, which is always my second favorite subject. So here's a little snapshot from October 1st, 2020, excuse me, through June of this year. All right, add a little commentary to this. Total non-compliant shipments from Q1 to Q3 in fiscal year 21, you can see right there is 1563. That's 4.5% lower from the same time the previous year in fiscal year 20. You already heard me say we only had a little delta in cargo. So, I mean, it's not that they're not coming, but we like to assume that a lot of the ISPM outreach that we've done, what, what Mr. Elissi was talking about with the big three and that stuff, we're going way beyond that uh, with him and through him to get the word out in the supply chain, might be working. Nearly 74% of the non-compliance are ISPM marking violations. That's still a trend. About 72% of the interdictions come on miscellaneous cargo. No change there from previous years. Big four, again, is Sarah Bissett's. For those that had a pest, 202 uh, of serambicids, and then you jump down to 100 curculion, it's down to 60 buprestids, and then sericids. It's uptick for us with 55 shipments with sericids through, through June. That's just not good. But we keep looking. Uh, we also had some successes on our, our penalty information. We had 654 total cases assessed where we uh, instituted liquidated damages. Went up penalize you for a portion of the value of the shipment because you're non-compliant with packing material and you got to be compliant as a condition of entry. Um, over $541,000 uh, collected amount. So as, as Mr. Alessi talked about the supply chain, we incorporated ISPM 15 requirements into our minimum security criteria, which is a fancy word for you got to do this if you're part of our supply chain program. If we trust you, then you have 11 agricultural criteria. The one agricultural security criteria is ISPM 15. Any cargo you bring in, slap wood on it, done age, whatever, like, gotta be compliant. You have any questions, you call us. You call uh, Mr. Elissi, staff, whatever. The only alternative to a live pest is abject refusal. I can't tell you how painful it has been for myself and Mr. Elissi, staff to go to court and do all these other things. We've been sustained, but that's not the point. Everybody's pushing buttons and envelopes, looking to litigate and that stuff in this arena. Why? Because you have just in time oil field parts from a major, major oil refinery company that's now got to go back to Germany and lose 60 days in the supply chain for just in time parts. Our message to them, know before you go, work with the National Plant Protection Organization through this one and you can avoid those delays. Very simple message and we don't do it snarky. Next page, canine, real quick. During the COVID, obviously training and personal face-to-face -face contact. You can't train a canine any other way. You just can't do it virtually. Um, we had some closures. We had a lot of problems and challenges. Well, not problems, stuff that happened. The cool thing about the NDDTC and Mr. Ulysses' uh, canine um, group down there, we worked around that and we did a work around Atlanta's Terminal 8 because Terminal 8 was closed for international passengers. We found a way to train at least some teams there. That took a while, but it worked out. We also come up with some remote training for some of the supervisory classes and stuff. Now, 
they're fully open down there. We have racked and stacked classes through the end of fiscal year 2022. I've got 175 canine handlers on board out of 189 positions. You always got a delta, people who drop and leash or retiring or whatever. We have added 27 canine supervisors. So now we'll have some coverage and some guidance and some oversight. And we're putting most importantly, eight regional advisors out there, geographically located, work to one branch chief to administer this national program because we've gone from 124 to 189 right now. Like Osama trying to build up, we want to build up. Why? It plays in Congress. They love this thing. The associations, they love it. Why? It works. It works. Next slide. All right. I'm done. I want to close with a few parting shots. It's been quite a year, but that's an understatement and almost nonsensical. We're preparing for business resumption. We're preparing with, for economic recovery because that's what we're supposed to do. We are Customs and Border Protection. We're at that front line. We're doing all of these things. Our line, though, is doing what you guys know best. We're hiring people. Plans are being made for future initiatives. We've got this biological threats thing that continues to expand and get a lot of energy from the other three-letter agencies. Other law enforcement agencies are collaborating with us regarding some of our interdictions, and more specifically, at those with the potential for nefarious intent and commercial smuggling. Never a boring day. Finally, our field operations staff has over 4,400 positive cases of COVID. All of you probably know someone that had COVID. We had 22 people die. They're at a port of entry working, and they died from COVID. That's just sad. This disease, guys, it's insidious. Doesn't care about your vitality, your race, ethnicity, ethnicity, better said, religion, gender, it doesn't care about anything else. If you've received the vaccine, congratulations. That was my job as a COVID czar. I can say you're my hero. You've greatly increased your opportunity to not die. If you haven't received the vaccine, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray for you. I suggest you strongly consider getting it because it's Delta variant. Mr. Lissy said, you know, I talked to epidemiologists. There's other variants out there. They're coming. It's bad. It's bad. I want to thank you guys because, you know, you guys got my rocks all just going like this. I'm so excited. Jay, I want to thank you very much for, for your patience and for finding my slide deck. Thank you.